The Texans lost to the Jaguars in energy this weekend, but not all hope is lost for the playoffs. We're going to talk about that and more on this edition of the bullpen. Welcome. I am James Roy. This is Tom Chabria. And as always, this is the bullpen. We are here to talk about Texans football on this Wednesday edition of the bullpen recap of the Texans Jaguars matchup. Tom, I was there and I can tell you this watching a 58 yard field goal attempt fall short and hit the crossbar from behind the field goal post in person is that much more disappointing than seeing it on TV. Cause I'm watching, I'm watching Amendola's kick fly and i'm like oh that looks like i'm like gaining hope as it's in the air and i see it at the top of its arc and i'm like oh i don't think that's gonna make it like very early on in that that kicks flight i was like eh. and then hitting the crossbar i was like oh maybe it did it no i didn't but a disappointing loss there was um there was some contention about the the officiating i think that the texans play played a big big role just as big if not bigger than the officiating in in the um outcome of the game that's to say that i think the officiating affected the outcome of a close game but if the texans had played you know better throughout the game in a lot there was some situations where cj took sacks he didn't need to take um that definitely had equal impact that field goal is a 58 yard field goal to win the game and literally I CJ goes set, you know, first play second and 25 makes it all back up first down. Now it's second and 19. He's taken all kinds of sacks. Um, I think CJ had an impressive game. Um, and I don't think it's all him. I think that offensive line played into it. Um, but I mean, do you agree? Do you, or do you think that the officiating is just the end all be all that cost the Texans this game? I absolutely feel that the officiating was a huge problem. Like, a huge, like that's 10 points that I feel like at minimum that the Jacksonville Jaguars were, were awarded because of third downs that were now first downs on plays that, that did not, that did not pan out for different, you know, whatever. And the officiating was probably as worse as I, and I'm not one of those people that wants to be, Oh, the officials, the officials, the officials. I don't want to do that. It's not what I want to do. This is the first time I felt like no, no. This was this was one of the poorest officiating games I've ever seen. The pass interference calls left and right, where it was just like so much ticky tack stuff that you never seen called. The fifty yard bomb to Tank Dell, which would probably have been another three points the other way, is not called. Tyreek Hill has that same play in his playbook every week, and we see it every week, and they complete it every time. And it's never an issue. And the fact that they threw the flag after the fact made it more suspect. That was when interesting you to see speaking to that play because I, I was talking to the guy next to me and he's like, they threw that early, early. And I said, no, they didn't throw it early. That flag came out after the play had happened. And then they called it on a motion, having two men in motion. There's literally not two men in motion. Um, I thought I heard something about motion towards the line of scrimmage, maybe being the penalty. But I, I'm just so confused on what they were looking for there. It, it was like they saw the big play and said, oh, no, Vegas isn't going to be happy. Here's the flag. So the the play you referenced, the the the, the final drive where uh, CJ gets sacked. It's a horse collar. The dude literally saw that, put yeah, his hand in the back of this man's jersey and pulled him down from it. In any world, and CJ turns around and looks at the ref who's standing right there with his hands up going, what are we doing here? CJ is not a little dude. It's not like that guy with his big meat hook could pull him down because he had been shaking tackles all game. So so when you talk about uh, CJ making mistakes, sure, sure. Could he have, could he have, uh, there was a couple plays he could have dropped back further. There was, there was definitely plays where he held on to the ball too long. This is a rookie quarterback. These are mistakes that happen throughout the game. These happen to vets. Mahomes makes these mistakes. Allen makes these mistakes. Tua makes these mistakes. They're magnified when you lose the game, of course. However, it shouldn't have been this close. Like when you look, when you objectively look at 
all that was awarded to Jacksonville by way of yellow hanky and what was what was denied to the Texans by way of yellow hanky one way or the other. It's not close. The game was not close. It was one sided. This these are these are uh, drives that that had stalled over and over again that were allowed to continue because of flags for pass interference, and and I can't I can't look at this Texan team and judge them harshly at all, knowing what I know, seeing what I saw. Poor Tavier Thomas, he gets he gets two pass interference on consecutive third downs, and then to ask to guard Calvin Ridley on the goal line, and everybody's cooking him on social media, and I'm like. What do you want him to do? He literally had the least contact with a receiver and got pass interference that you could have. I don't know. I don't know how you expect him to guard anybody. And, and then it's what their best guy. A lot of times they use penalties like like for example with holding, they'll throw that flag to try and like let the o, the O-line know, "Hey, we're seeing a lot of holding. We're calling this one to let you know you need to uh, like back off." But the way that that progressed, they were like watching Tavier Thomas and and flagging him to the point where like I watched that cross with uh with Ridley that you're talking about where he gave up the touchdown and I'm like, what is he supposed to do? He just got flagged two times in a row for what was not pass interference by definition, and then is asked to guard you know Calvin Ridley on a crossing route, and he's like, can I make contact with him? If I touch him, am I going to get called for a pass interference? Like they they removed his ability to play defense by flagging him out of the ability to play coverage like that. That's not his fault. That's a, an officiating issue. So I, I 100% agree with that. I I do think, so uh, with the two sides to it, as you know, a lot of people like to compare, and a common narrative that has come out of this game has been that CJ is still a better quarterback than Trevor Lawrence. And so I think that's it's a deeper discussion than people are giving it credit for. Some people are saying, based on this game, that CJ Stroud's a better uh, quarterback than Trevor Lawrence. And I would... I would argue that in this game in particular, even though uh, Kirk Benkert um, from Sleeper brings up a great point, which is that um, Trevor Lawrence had a lot of help from the officials um, that kind of bolstered his play. Um, but Trevor Lawrence hit, you know, hit the passes at the scheme gave Jacksonville like several 30 and 40 yard passes that just really decimated the Texans defense. Um but I would say that in this game, isolated, we can say that Trevor Lawrence was the better quarterback just looking at how the game carried on, the result. There's a lot of different factors. But if we're looking at the season, then we're looking at C.J. Stroud as the better quarterback. Do you, How do you feel? I, I know that we've talked about this, and you, you feel like the comparison is like not important. But I, I, and I was just about to say that. I could care less. Like, like I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do, when they made the big thing out of, you know, Peyton Manning versus Tom Brady, Peyton Manning versus Tom Brady, every time they played, they wanted to make it a 1v1 thing. Football is not that at all. So anytime you want to drive the comparative, the, the comparisons and, and, and generate the narratives, it's just kind of silly to me because you've got this defense that you've got to deal with who could be dealing with injuries or whatever. And then you have your own uh, uh, issues on offense with the line and things of that nature. So, I mean, the Texans lost, you know, their left guard, what, midway through the game? So it's easy to say, and 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 in and, and the same token, uh, I think their left tackle for Jacksonville went out too. So I don't necessarily look too much into that. I mean, it, you can pick whatever you want to pick and go up. Well, this makes this guy better up oh, that guy. In the end, to me, it really just a matter about winning football games. No one's going to care that, you know, this quarterback carved up that defense if they don't win. And that's why we're having this conversation about, well, Lawrence is better than Stroud. The end result is, is, is what's driving that numbers wise. You're not saying that, you know, Stroud was the better quarterback, uh, numbers wise. I mean, for me, obviously, uh, Lawrence threw for a ton of yards and a lot of that was yak. There was so much yak for Trevor Lawrence. It was, it was awesome. And, and that's really something that probably is more on the defense than it is CJ. You know what I mean? You saw, you saw Jacksonville go into a shell, a cover two shell where it was like, we're going to keep everything in front. That's why CJ had 40 something yards rushing and Lawrence had none. Like it's, 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 the chess game, right? So I can't sit there and go, well, 
this guy's better than that guy when it's like apples to oranges. You know, you're facing two totally different schemes. And and there's a lot that goes into this. I I, I like how you said it. You know, it, it's a team game. It's hard to compare one quarterback to another because there's so many factors. Um, I think that at the end of the day, people will tell you that wins are not a QB stat. But at the end of the, but also at the end of the day, um, we've seen a lot of Texans fans come to this realization. C.J. Stroud's impact on the win loss column is one of the main reasons why a lot of people really like him at quarterback and one of the reasons why he's being viewed as this you know elite level quarterback so early on in his career because early on he's having that impact on the win column and so also you have to look at all all the different factors around this game like i said earlier um and and i agree with you that you know other elite quarterbacks do this but it is something that was of somewhat of a problem cj's play outside of you know just how many yards he threw for and touchdowns like he had some really good plays but he also had a lot of plays where he hung on to the ball too long or didn't drop deep enough and, you know, the offensive line did as best they could. Um, and I'm not saying that it was always his fault or the offensive line's fault, but some of those sacks, you have to think that may, like CJ was trying to do a little bit too much with the ball. And I I love that about him. That That's not a bad thing from my perspective because I think some of his best plays this season would come across if, like, it's um it's like going forward on a fourth and one, like really at, at the, your, uh, the opponent's 40-yard line, right, instead of, you know, maybe trying a long field goal. If you make it, you're a genius, right? Or sorry, fourth fourth and goal and going for a touchdown. If you're fourth and one and you go for it and you don't make it, like you look like an idiot because why didn't you take the three points? But if you make it, you look really smart. And so that's what it looks like with, with CJ right now where he, he likes to extend those plays and he likes to really get out there and try and make something happen. And when he does, it's amazing. And it's the best thing. And now he's an MVP. But when he doesn't, People are going to come to you like I am right now and say, you know, CJ was hanging on to the ball too long. And, 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 you know, that's why, you know, those sacks he took really affected the end result of the game. And, and we have to acknowledge that. So it's, it's a double edged sword. And so I don't want him to stop doing that. I think it's one of his best qualities. But at the end of the day, him hanging on to the ball too long and trying to make too much on those drives and taking those sacks was adversely affecting our ability to make that game winning drive. Um, so with the QB comparison, I think people like to compare QBs because I think it's coping. I, I'll be the first to admit that I'm coping with this loss by trying to a, a make CJ better than Trevor Lawrence. That's my, you, you got to take something from this. You've got to take a win. And so my win is that I, you know, nine times out of 10, you know, actually, you know, 10 times out of 10, twice on Sunday, whatever you want to say, I would take CJ Stroud over Trevor Lawrence to start a franchise. Easy, 100%. I have no doubt about that. And so I'm going to use everything in my power comparatively to try and make myself feel better about the fact that we lost by three points, even though we had the better quarterback in my mind. So that I think is where the, the comparison comes from. There's so much nuance to it. And it's hard to just absolutely say, oh, well, you know, CJ had a better game today because like you said, the yak, there's there's so many factors, but that is where it comes from is, is just coping. And so I'm I come to you today to cope with this loss by talking about how great CJ is and and thank God that I can do that because it's been some dark years at the quarterback position. You take this loss and there's nothing to cope with. You just go, okay, well we suck, but now we don't. We're not a bad team. Well, see, and here's the thing. And this is why I think you have to be really careful how you build your castles and how you tear other ones down because we sat here for weeks leading up to this game Talking about Trevor Lawrence now, he was just a guy and not a really good quarterback, and everybody wanted to go after this man. And I said, mm, maybe don't do that. He wins football games. And he went out and won a football game. So you can cope however you want to cope. Nobody can tell you how to fan. Uh, that's that's one of the biggest things we, we found ourselves doing, you know, with Astros Twitter and Astros PSF and all the you'd have all these guys saying this is how you have to fan and that's how you have to fan. And, and I won't tell you one way is better than the other. Do whatever you want to do it. However, if you are more respectful to some of these other teams going, look, I know you don't like the guy for whatever reason, but then at the end of the day, he put his team in the playoffs last year. He's putting himself in a damn good position to be in the playoffs this year. Gotta respect that. And then and now it just hurts that much more when you when you tear this guy down, tear this guy down, then he comes into your house and wins. And now you're going, Well, crap. Now, now, now what am I supposed to do? Now you're coping. Now you're trying to sell yourself and everyone else. Doesn't matter. CJ's the guy. He's he's the guy. 
the way I would, the way I would address it, the way I would look at it, the way I would handle it is like, look, go into this game. I said it, covered it on the app, said it, you know, last week, it's a good team. This is, this is not a pushover. This is not a game that you go, man, we're really bad. If we lose this team, there's a lot of good teams that have lost to the Jacksonville Jaguars this season. It's not like they're just out of nowhere. It's not like they're beating bad teams. It's, you know, they're respected around the league. Doug Peterson's respected around the league. That team's got weapons. Kirk, Ridley, uh, Etienne. They've, I mean, it's it's legit. Defense, Josh Allen, amazing. After the game, people are going, Will Anderson, where you at? Because look at Josh Allen. And I'm like, nah. Uh, I think it's Josh Allen. I, I can't remember. Josh uh, Allen is yeah, yeah, yeah. the D lineman, yeah. Not to be confused with the quarterback, yeah. Um, but <laughs> when, when the Bills play the Jaguars, it's confusing. Josh <laughs> Allen sacks Josh Allen for a while. I bet eight. that's got to be crazy. <laughs> But I mean, you can you can take this loss and go. Okay, we went toe to toe with one of the best teams in in football. You can say that they're eight and three, one of the best teams in football, one of the best records in football. I think there's only one better, and it was it was a field goal. It was fifty a fifty eight yard field goal from being a different story, and being able to say that you beat that team twice in one season potentially. Um, I the question I'd like to ask you is since since we're since we're coping. Are you of the mind? I mean, you were there in that moment. Would you have rather CJ went for it on fourth and 12 or were you okay with the 50 yard field goal? I think the field goal was always the answer. My biggest issue with the whole thing is that, um, so if you remember that play and if I remember it correctly, let's see, let's test my brain here. Um, on the thir- third and twelve, he, he gets into a situation where once again, he's, he's scrambling, he's rolling around, running around. And there's a point where he rolls right, he rolls back towards the left side of the field and has what looks like a lot of time to find someone and just doesn't see somewhere to throw it and ends up, he just barely throws the ball away towards Singletary while he's being tackled. So the question becomes if he had been more decisive, and this is a conversation I had with the guy next to me throughout the game was that CJ's not the kind of guy who's going to step up and just run the ball. Um, he, He will... But his first instinct is to take as much time as it takes to find a pass because he knows it's the more effective way to move the ball down the field. But in that situation, a more decisive, I, in, in, in the moment, it looked like it. Obviously, you could go back on the replay and it, it could be this thing where there was you know, never a path for it. But you have to think that at some point when he broke free, when he had all that time, he either could have found, found a check down. It looked like there was a check down available. Um, and he was going for more, or maybe he could have more decisively decided to run the ball, and that would any amount of yardage gained on that play literally would have put that field goal in the uprights without considering anything that changes based on how you view time and how that changes based off how events happen. I'm channeling my inner nerd here with you know, all that, but um, but just thinking about the fact that anything that changed on that play that would have gained us positive yards literally would have put that ball through the uprights. Um, it, it's tough to not like the decision to go for a field goal. I'm more focused on the play before and why we you know, didn't do something to put ourselves in a better position to kick the field goal. So that that's where I'm coming from from there. But I now I'd like to ask you, think about it for a minute here. We, we, I said at the beginning of the episode, we talked about the playoff implications. And I think a lot of people forget that the Texans crushed the Jaguars. Like they did not, that was not a close game that we played earlier in the season. And both teams are different teams at this point. So to see a close game between the two just means that these are two very evenly matched teams right now, which is great for the division, for football. And, you know, if the officiating was better, maybe I'd be happier about the result. But um, at the end of the day, you look towards the playoffs and the Texans' playoff chances were um, affected. At the end of this, by a significant margin, it was 72% if they had won, 38% if they lost, based on whoever you look at. I don't know the source for that. I just saw a graphic from a reputable source that said that. And the reason for that is, is that the Texans moved from you know tying and going into the lead in the AFC South, being the you know third or fourth seed in the NFL, to out of the playoffs with that loss. Um, do you think? That moving forward, the Texans playoff, it, it, the focus shifts obviously away from the division. When you look at the schedule coming up, I don't think there's really a, it's 
there's not a universe where the Jaguars lose enough games and the Texans win out and and they take the AFC South. I'd love to be wrong. I'm saying that in hopes that we can replay this clip later down the road and it be wrong. So, you know. Um, <laughs> the opening for the bullpen is yes. James Roy going, there's and not there's enough no games. universe yeah. where that. <laughs> but, um, but with that, there's, there's a lot of things that happen from that. Um, I know you don't like to focus on this, but CJ Stroud's MVP chances significantly tank with the division out of reach. Um, but I don't want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about um, how you feel about the upcoming schedule. I think there's a lot of people who watched the beginning of the season and saw a lot of the teams were playing up next and went, oh, those are easy games. And then they're still judging the schedule based off that. Um, but, I mean, how do you think the Texans playoff – Chances are down, do you, or do you think it's a pretty easy path to getting a wild card spot? I don't think anything is easy in the National Football League. I, I mean, I, I would love to sit here and and tell you that oh, they're going to win every game, and nobody that they play going forward is better than the team that they just played. I could say that, and that would make a loss to one of these teams hurt that much more. So respecting that all these teams are are better than they were at the beginning of the season that they've played competitive football that they've been in some games with good teams you have to you have to kind of respect that you know what i mean there's there's no one you can sleep on uh, i mean there have been teams that have taught us that you know the the Miami Dolphins beat the Denver Broncos who what we are playing or who the Texans are playing this this coming sunday they hung 70 on them and Denver has since then went on a tear, and now they are right there smack dab in the middle of the playoff hunt. They're quite literally one spot behind us. A loss here would put them ahead of us. So so things change, and they're playing good defense. Um, uh, Broncos country is, 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 is rolling or however, however you want to say that yeah, yeah, they're riding, whatever. Uh, they've been good. So I'm not going to sit here and go, they should win every game. They're going to make the playoffs. It's a foregone conclusion. I feel like they have a great chance. I think that everything in front of them is totally attainable. No team that they play is 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 light years ahead of them. It's it. All these games are gonna they're gonna have to go in and do their work. They can't have bad games. You know, uh, they need a little bit of luck. They're gonna need to make a fifty-eight yarder where they missed one. I, I think every team needs that. Regardless By the way, they're, I, I just saw that they're they're signing Amendola to the practice squad after he clears waivers, which means he's likely going to be the kicker again next week. I heard they were working out Brett Maher. They're working they, him out. I don't know if they're going to sign Maher. Uh, they they activated Charlie Heck, which, if I'm not mistaken, is their last re- designation for return from IR, which means that um, if I understand that correctly, Kiami Fairbairn cannot come back from IR. I could be wrong. But my understanding was that they have eight players they can designate to return from IR, and Charlie Heck, who was just designated to return, um, would be the eighth if if I read that correctly. My understanding is that because he's on IR, short term, he had to be out for four games, so he has to miss the Broncos game. No scenario where uh, Fairbairn can play Sunday. Well, yeah, he was always going to miss Sunday. the The question was, who are we going to get to kick instead of him if we were going to drop out Mendola, but what I'm trying to say is is that I believe, based on my understanding, that he is now out for the season. Who is? Because, because I don't... I, so there's some amount of players that you can bring back from IR. I believe it's eight. And when they brought that, when they designated Juice Scruggs for return from IR, um, that was seven. And so I don't know if Charlie Heck it counts as one of those designations or not. I can't imagine designating your you know, a, a backup tackle to return from IR would be smart, knowing that you only had one person to bring back. But I don't know how that works. I do believe that you will get Fairbairn back at I some point it too. But uh, I don't know exactly the the rules and all that jazz. I don't know who's going to kick for them. Uh, to be honest, I as much as. You could go, well, Amadola, you got to make that. Or Amadola, you got to make the one earlier in the game that he missed. I'm like, 50-yard field goals aren't a sure thing. Field goal kickers aren't a sure thing. People miss field goals. People miss extra points. So I didn't think he played that bad. I think a lot is expected of those guys because they don't do much. But when they do, they have to do it all. 
So you, you feel good when you have a good field goal kicker. You feel stressed when you don't. I get it. I understand. If you're scoring touchdowns like you like to talk about, you don't have to worry about the field goal kicker. There you go. <laughs> now, Tom, I know that you're a here and now guy. I've come to learn that in our time hosting this podcast together. So I know you're not going to like my next question. At least that's what I'm thinking. But I all that set up around talking about the playoffs, this is a recap of the Texans-Jaguars game, which means that the question obviously would have to make its way back around to the Jaguars. Um, I I want to talk about the pass rush here in a minute, but um, my question right now is, is that there's been a lot of talk, and we've talked about it briefly about splitting series and, and sweeping in the season and how that looks. Um, are you a person who is a huge proponent of the Texans playing the Jaguars in the postseason, or would you rather avoid that matchup? I would absolutely love to play them in the postseason. I would be more concerned if the Texans would have swept them in the season series and then played them in the postseason. So coming so off your of a brain loss, is, is relaxed now that we split. You're like in a better place. I, I feel like there's more of a healthy respect where if you beat a team twice, you tend to go, eh. We beat those guys. We beat those guys. We beat them at their place. We beat them at our place. We beat those guys. You sleep on them. You play down a little bit. The fact that they lost to them in NRG in, in a game where they felt like they kind of got robbed. I've never seen D'Amico Ryan so demonstrative on a sideline. He was absolutely furious. And that's one of the most laid back, even kill dudes you'll ever see coach a football game. For you know what I mean, head coach. He, he oh, yeah, just so so mellow. So you know, I played the game. Ebbs and flows. They're okay. I'm I'm the same. To- I saw him get really livid, and I just that makes me think. Okay, it's not just me. You know, it takes a lot. He he knows how the game's played. He was a linebacker. Obviously, he has all of that experience. So he felt he got jobbed. I guarantee you, if the Texans see these these Jaguars again. They're coming for blood. They're 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 not gonna forget that game, and I would want that. No, yeah, I think it would be. I don't want to say it would be disappointing, but if the if, say the Texans make the playoffs and they play a different team in the wild card, and the Jaguars, who I still believe, you know, choking is in their DNA to some extent. So postseason changes things. Um, it'd be a shame if they couldn't do uphold their end of the bargain. That's what. I, been saying about the Astros Dodgers for the past six years is just it's a shame that when each team makes the post you know the World Series that the other one doesn't hold up their end of the bargain and get there so I would love to see that matchup now I'd like to talk about the pass rush and then after that um, as y'all know last week we did a segment where we did our you know I, I believe we're calling it the bullpen uh, bullpen prop bullpen bullpen parlay yeah bullpen parlay I like that you like that I like that we, we did each did our own uh, predictions, and we're going to talk about um, how each of those went. And new, uh, you know, spoiler alert: Tom is a little better at this than I am. <laughs> so, but the let's talk about the Texans' pass rush though before we get there. The one thing that we noted, it, you know, whether you assign blame to CJ or to the Texans' offensive line, CJ was sacked four times. Um, it was very um, detrimental to a lot of important drives. Um, the pressure was there pretty much all game. CJ was was ducking and, and diving and trying to make anything happen. Do you do you feel like the Texans pass rush dropped the ball when it came to putting that same pressure on Trevor Lawrence? I don't know. I, I, I wanted to say that initially. And then the more I got to thinking about it, the more I sat down, the more I, I processed. I felt like the scoreboard had a lot to do with it. You know, the Texans playing catch up. They, they only ran the ball 18 times and six of them were CJ Stroud. So when you're very one dimensional, you're, you're, those guys are literally pinning their ears back and going, they're going to throw the ball every time. So when I think about it, that's asking a lot. Now, like we talked about, I wouldn't say that all four of those sacks are on the offensive line when they're giving him three, four, five, six seconds, whatever the case may be to sit back there and throw the football. As there, there's a couple times that I know of. He's got to get. He's got to just throw it away. Live to fight another day, and 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 there's a point where okay, I can't extend any further. Let me let me just let me just dump it. You know what I mean? If he's worried about accuracy numbers or something like that, well, I hope that's not the case. I hope because that's not the case. there there are some times where it just seemed like he just wanted to hold on to the ball just far too long, and 
I want to say the average is you, you get like two seconds, you know, two point something. I can't remember the exact number, but you get like two practice, seconds. Having played offensive line briefly, the expectation at the high school level for practice was four seconds. That was like, you know, just to practice for practice's sake, like four seconds was a reasonable amount of time to expect you to hold up. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think getting to your point about the play calling distribution, you know, 12 run plays, truly 18 run plays. If you include CJ's runs, um, there was a lot of talk throughout the season about let CJ cook. Why are we so committed to the run game? And we found out here that, you know, when the run game falls short and we just rely on CJ, it doesn't always work. Um, and I, I don't think that's reflective on CJ. I think that, um, at the, at the end of the day, the Jaguars' defensive, you know, uh, run defense really did a good job of holding up a you know a freshly returned Damian Pierce and Devin Singletary. And I think that if we get even a slightly more effective run game, um, that that this game could turn out different in spite of the officiating. So, I, but I, I I do think that our pass rush was just not. Not super impressive as, as it needed to be, and I think that that's been in the past what has held Trevor Lawrence, you know, accountable. So I think that's one of the sources of one of his better games against the Texans in his career. I mean, I didn't think, I didn't think that our pass rush was so bad as much as you saw the screen game from from uh I, I just thought they schemed really well there was there was quick slants here and there there was there was the, the screen game you know etn ran the ball a little bit i thought they did a really good job of moving lawrence around to like basically going look we're not just going to let him stand back there and let you come after him and I, I, I tip my cap to Jacksonville they did a really good job of going the last time because if i if i remember correctly in Jacksonville, the, the the pass rush was in him the entire time. He he had a horrible day, and then here in Houston, it was a different. You know, they they're like, oh, we're not doing that again. And they they schemed to get the ball out quick. And like I said, there was tons of yak yard. There was guys. You know, I mean, he he made some plays. He he out, he extended some plays, I should say, but. By and large, everything came out quick, and you just didn't have enough time. I mean, would you say the difference between C.J. Stroud and Trevor Lawrence yesterday in that regard was that when C.J. or when when Lawrence had to extend the play, his his internal clock was a little more in tune with what was going on. And so, and like I've said, I want to re-clarify this because I don't want anyone coming at me thinking that I don't like what C.J. does there. I 100% think that C.J.'s ability to extend the play and his desire to find the most yards is one of his better traits. But at the end of the day in this game, there was some sacks and some some severely detrimental plays to the Texans that were a result of hanging on to the ball and trying to find that play for maybe a little too long. Whereas Trevor Lawrence um is is you know, as the kind of quarterback that he is, is more likely to throw it away sooner due to having that, you know, clock in his head going a little quicker. I mean, like 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 I get back to it, I and I don't want to harp on it, but I feel like it needs to be said the Jags had a better balance. You know, they ran the ball 30 times. So, and, and they didn't do it effectively either. When, when I was, I was <laughs> just didn't. pulling it up. I was just pulling it up. Uh, Travis Etienne ran the ball 20 times for 56 yards, 2.8 yards a carry. Uh, Dernis Johnson had seven carries for 19 yards. Uh, Tank Bigsby, one carry for six yards. And then Lawrence, two carries for no yards. So, I mean, those plays are plays that, all right, now now I'm going to not have the opportunity to rush the passer. When you look at what the Texans did, it's like, how do you expect CJ to sit back there and throw the ball 36 times and only run the ball 18 times and not have the pass rush in him? Like, it's just so lopsided one way. I mean, it's tough. Like they're pinning their ears back and they're just running for him. They're just going for it. Well, I mean, on that note, I guess we can talk about how wrong I was and how right you were <laughs> in a different way with the bullpen parlay. I'll go first since I, you know, I, and honestly, I was only wrong on one thing and and I don't want it to come across as fan bias, 
legitimately the trend with Trevor Lawrence playing the Texans is that he just doesn't do super well. And so maybe that's bias. Maybe that's like a, a trend. But I, I feel like this performance is the outlier. And so I don't feel like I was out of line for saying this. But my my parlay was uh, was 264.5 over under for passing yards for Trevor Lawrence. I took the under, which looks really dumb now with all those yards <laughs> after the catch. But that happened. Um, but I, I got everything else right. Tank Dell came into the game with a three-game streak with touchdowns. He extended it to four. I took the anytime touchdown over half, so he got that. And then, uh, you know, obviously with the lack of run game, CJ threw it so much that um, I took the over on on completions at 23 and a half, and CJ hit on that. And so two for three is not bad, but that is just the one part where you, the one area where you don't want to be two for three. You got to be three for three. Um, so I'm 0 for 1 on the season as it goes because it's just, you know, all it takes is one. But Tom, what do you got? So I had three picks. I, I, I felt really strongly that CJ Stroud was going to exceed his prop for yardage. And he did that with relative ease. I, I had no question about that. The man's thrown for 300 yards in, I think, four straight games. Four straight and, games, yeah. Yeah, and that that his prop was 275 yards, I think it was. Easy pick. Uh, Nico Collins, I felt like without Noah Brown, Nico Collins stood to at least exceed his prop. I, I didn't peg him for 100 yards, but he, he got 100 yards. His prop was 60 yards. And then um, I had Christian Kirk. I figured, obviously, this game was going to be a shootout. It turned into that a little bit. I thought that with uh, Derek Sealing Jr. matching up against Calvin Ridley, that Kirk would be able to eat. He exceeded his player prop. I mean, every wide receiver for uh, the Jags, with the exception, I guess, of Ingram, probably got their props because they threw for 360 some odd yards. Well, I liked your your logic on the Christian Kirk prop. I thought that I thought that was really well thought out, and it, and it played out that way. I mean, I watched Kirk get get a lot of targets when, uh, early on when. When Ridley wasn't getting through initially, um, Kirk was catching a lot of work, and it, and it that helped him out definitely. What was the prop for for Trevor Lawrence? Because I'm I'm interested in in what was, was the under sixty four and a half yards. Um, I took the under, and he okay. literally threw for one hundred yards more than that. <laughs> so. In your defense, he threw for two hundred sixty two yards against uh, Tennessee the week prior. So a much lesser defense. Yep. Yep. And a hundred eighty four can go either way. True. Like, you never know how it's and any given Sunday is <clears throat> amplified in the division. Absolutely. So, tough, tough to project that. So Tom is, is one and O oh, and I am O oh and one. So if you're looking for advice, hit Tom up, add him on Twitter. Cause he's the expert. Not really the expert. I don't want to say that. I don't want to put you in that legal situation. Tough. He <laughs> said, well, I, I listened to Tom's advice, and now I'm out. No, okay, well, don't don't listen to Tom's advice then. But somebody but get the gambling disclaimer in there now. If you don't get the disclaimer problem. in there now, we're not experts. <laughs> we're not experts. Um, I guess this is a good time to to bring it to a close. Do you have any final thoughts on the Texans Jaguars game before we throw some dirt on it and move on to next week? I think the sky is not falling. I think there's still plenty of season left. Uh, CJ in his post game said it, you know, we're not hanging our heads. This is a good football team. It was a good game. We didn't end out on top. Move on. Get ready for the next one. I think they're still going to have a great season. Yeah. Um, my final thoughts are um, Tank Dell caught it. I know we didn't even touch on that during the episode. I was just, I, I knew I was going to be pissed off if I, if I brought it up and that I'd probably lose my mind, but you know what better time than the end of the episode to say it tank Dell caught it put it on a t-shirt sell it it'll sell out in the city of houston because we all know he caught it that's our that's our moment tank Dell caught it all right well it's been real it's been fun and it's been real fun love talking texans with y'all i am james roy and you can find me at m1 texans fan on uh twitter on uh you know because that's what i refer to it as because i don't believe in x um <laughs> tom is right there with me this is like my most boomer opinion, I guess. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and also on Instagram and TikTok, it's also how you can find the YouTube channel. If you are listening to this, you probably are listening on Spotify or Apple Music. But if you want to watch, that's where you can find it. Um, and if you want to listen, I just told you where you can find the podcast over there. 
If you could like, comment, subscribe, that, all that really helps us out. Um, I got a DM this week about mic levels. I'm always down for constructive criticism on how the podcast is going. You guys listen to it. You guys know what you want. So shoot me a DM anywhere and we can work on that. Um, PSF. We're on the PSF app. This next week against the Broncos is our last live coverage game that we're doing. Um, flex, if you will, to noon as much as that we probably don't think that that's a flex. I guess that that benefits us in some way. Not really. Um so yeah, t download the PSF app and join the Texans chat. It is the way of watching sports of the future. It's being with your fellow fans digitally interacting and watching the game. So tune in there. And um, if you're looking for Tom, he is at Third Coast Tom on Twitter. Uh, so that's where you can find him. He delivers some great thoughts. And the Dynamo, they're moving on. So if you want good Dynamo stuff, him, me, there's a lot of good Dynamo accounts to follow if you're into that. All right. Thanks for watching. This has been the bullpen. And uh, until next time, vamos Texans.